Good morning, friends. Welcome uh, to CEC live lecture series. And uh, in this series, these days, we are running uh, our, a program on world literature. And uh, world literature uh, has been also explained in terms of its diversity as well as the specific nature. Uh, we have covered a large number of countries and languages. And uh, as you would have seen, that uh, uh, all literatures uh, created by writers in the 20th century, they finally integrate into what is called world literature. So uh, under this series, uh, uh, today uh, uh, we'll be uh, uh, requesting Dr. Racha Bajaj, uh, who's, uh, who teaches English literature uh, in Hindu College, Delhi University. She's an expert on, uh, on, on, on certain things. And uh, today's area, so far as she's concerned, is uh, literature in Sri Lanka. And uh, because we are doing Southeast Asia, and uh, the previous lecture was on uh, Faz Ahmad Faz, so this is in that series as the second lecture. Uh, before I uh, request Dr. Richard Bajaj to uh, uh, engage in discussion here, uh, let me tell you, friends, that uh, we are available uh, on uh, uh, 1800110430. This is a telephone uh, toll free number, and you can use this number for uh, having uh, questions from us, uh, asking questions from us, uh, disagreeing with us, telling us uh, a certain alternative paradigms, whatever. And uh, the last 10 minutes can be devoted uh, to a discussion with the viewers. Uh, let me repeat the toll free number, this one 110 And uh, the time uh, fixed for this discussion is 10.50. Uh, <coughs> Uh, Dr. Chabajaj is, uh, I already introduced uh, you to her, and uh, uh, before she begins, uh, let me uh, ask a question from her. Uh, I was wondering whether, you know, uh, uh, literature has some connection with the time in which it is produced, and uh, whether this also applies to uh, Sri Lankan literature, because Sri Lanka has a time span in which, you know, the, the world, the reality operates there, and uh, it might also be affecting the writers of Sri Lanka in that respect. So uh, you can, in fact, uh, comment on this and then we can chat further. Yes, I mean, uh, what, yeah, what are you asking in the sense that literature and life have a connection with one another as far as Sri Lanka is, is concerned? concerned? And secondly, uh, the, the connection is of what kind? Is it a direct connection? Is it a connection that comes through something else? So the, uh, in the, the canvas of today's lecture is primarily modern Sri Lankan literature. Mm -hmm. And uh, when we consider the modern times in Sri Lanka, then uh, the two issues that uh, really uh, become the mainstay of most writing written in, this, uh, in the past century is to do with uh, the civil war um, that it saw in the 20th century and the tsunami. Uh, that you know we uh, that that becomes a kind of a fear and a constant presence in uh, Sri Lankan literature. So uh, yes, it is true that in that sense, life and aspects of life and events of life, uh, you know, create an impact on the sensibility of the writers, and therefore they start um, a, you know engaging with narratives of the personal kind that actually also reflect on the. Uh, life of the time. So, which means people don't mention, people don't refer to it, but then it gets reflected. That's what you say. No, there, there are it's, uh, no. I, in fact, what I mean to say is that there are direct references mm -hmm. to uh, political uh, happenings in the country, to natural disasters in the country, and then their impressions get carried um, over to their literary works. In fact, uh, their right, the war that we are talking about actually is the civil war that uh, took place in Sri Lanka, uh, in particularly in the post-independence period around the 1950s or so, and it continued for three decades. So writers who have lived through this period or are the progeny of the, nec uh, the next generation that have that's trying to deal with this kind of an issue, they're all reflecting at uh, the, uh, the past or the present in that sense and uh, trying to make sense of what has happened and where are we headed. Can you give some details about the civil war that happened in uh, Sri Lanka? Yes, let me, um, uh, you know, give it, a, uh, let me just tell the history a bit of this particular incident that uh, one is referring to and then we can come back for 
discussion on the uh, Sri Lankan yes. literature. Yes. So, uh, uh, viewers, um, you, uh, just to acquaint you a bit about the 20th century uh, Sri Lankan life and also to talk about uh, the, uh, you know, the demography or the, the, the kind of, uh, uh, you know, ethnic groups that uh, are a part of Sri Lanka. So, you will note that uh, Sri Lanka has actually four major ethnic or social groups, you can call them. They are the Sinhalese. Uh, uh, who was the Sinhali speaking population that it's a different ethnic group then there are the Sri Lankan Tamils who uh, who are who also uh, form an important part of the region then there are the Muslims who uh, inhabit the area and also the Tamils who have uh, come who have a recent origin Indian origin uh, so to speak so these are the four uh, major kind of a um, uh, you know, ethnic groups that uh, live in Sri Lanka. Two kinds of Tamils? Uh, Two kinds of Tamils. Yeah, one ki uh, Tamils who, they are Sri Lankan Tamils who have been here, who have been uh, living in Sri Lanka since centuries. In fact, uh, when I come to the, uh, you know, the tussle between the Sinhalese and the Sri Lankan Tamils, then we'll see that their uh, conflict is actually uh, as old as, the, you know, people have traced that conflict to 6th century AD. So, you know, there are those Tamils who have lived for centuries in Sri Lanka and there are others who have, who are actually of Indian origin but have then uh, moved to Sri Lanka. So, they are the Tamils of recent or, uh, Indian origin, that's the meaning. So, in addition to these uh, groups, there are some smaller groups as well of uh, Aboriginal uh, population, you could call them. So, they are the Burgers, the Malays and the Vedas uh, who also occupy, you know, they're not, uh, their numbers may be small but, you know, they're, they're a part of of that history, they, their lineages can be traced to 400 years or so. So, they have been a part of the region. So, these are the smaller groups that uh, constitute uh, a Sri Lankan population. Now, the Sinhalese uh, who follow, they follow in religion, their pra practices to follow Buddhism. So, they are mostly Buddhist and they constitute, the Sinhalese constitute about 70 percent of uh, the total population in Sri Lanka. Now, 70 percent of the total population is Sinhalese and you have on the other hand the Sri Lankan Tamils who form about 13 percent of the population. Now, obviously, in terms of um, the percentage, we can see the, that the Sinhalese are in majority in the region and Tamils form the minority. It's, uh, the, uh, if one could say it's, it's among all minorities, it's perhaps a considerable min or min minority which still has substantial, um, you know, percentage of uh, people living there. So, it, it is in a position to fight with the Tamils, uh, sorry, with the Sinhalese, unlike the others who, have, uh, who are very small in numbers. So, uh, the Tamils who form 13 percent of this population, these two and the Sinhalese that form about 70 percent, they uh, have come into conflict particularly uh, in the 1950s and 1956 is that exact time when uh, in the post independence period, you actually had the uh, a, a law which passed uh, which made Sin, uh, you know, which made Sinhalese or Sinhala actually the uh, uh, the language, the official language of the re region and it is considered that, you know, that is the origin of the conflict between the Tamils and the, Sinha uh, the Sinhalese. Now, these two, uh, these two groups then they have remained in conflict over territorial claim and um, Sri Lankan Tamils, uh, uh, who are mostly Hindus, live in the northern province of or the northern regions and also some eastern, northeast regions of Sri Lanka, such as, you know, so the n northern regions that they mostly uh, live in is Jaffna and the surrounding areas, uh, you know, there, there are these uh, uh, forest lands, there is, there are other areas surrounding the place which, uh, uh, where most of the Tamils live. Uh, the, uh, the Sri Lankan Tamils. Now, th when, so this particular region, because it was predominantly, uh, you know, uh, occupied by the Tamils, so the Tamils uh, actually, um, uh, they, they led, uh, th this kind of a thing led to a demand by uh, the Tamils for a regional autonomy. And they wanted to some kind of autonomy of that region because a large population uh, of the uh, Tamil speaking people, they lived there. And this led to this regional uh, autonomy then led to a kind of a, a call for or a demand for a separate Tamil state. 
Now this became the point of contention between the two groups precisely because the Tamils looked for, the Sri Lankan Tamils looked to have a separate a state for the Tamils and this did not go well with the majority population and also the authorities uh, the, you know, in power because you see uh, Jaffna or the northern tip of Sri Lanka is a very strategically, a strategic kind of a place as well. It's that, it's, it's the peers uh, top so they you know it's like losing out on one's territory and then it becomes a problem of unification and uh, and the and the narratives of nationalism also come in when you know uh, when looked at from the point of view of the state or the government so you know just because a region calls for a separate state then it becomes a national issue then and an issue where uh, the authorities also become involved so it no it's no more a kind of a cultural ethnic conflict or a clash it becomes a kind of a problem of the nation it becomes a kind of a national issue you know so it's now no more uh, left to a uh, kind of a tussle between two ethnic groups uh, as we may call them so you see this issue of uh, separation then precisely led to the conflict between the sinhalese and the tamil people and uh, the Sinhal uh, sinhalese believed you know and they have always believed that sri lanka fundamentally belonged to the Sin uh, sinhalese buddhist people obviously that's the majoritarian view the major view of the majority that well we are in majority and therefore uh, the land belongs to us and the rules of the land need to uh, be molded and set according to our needs and well the minorities may be given some leeway but they cannot uh, guide action or guide the nation in that manner so you see the, that also feeds in that also brings about the minority and the majority issue in, in, into play but uh, you know this conflict is uh, not uh, seen as purely an ethnic conflict but as also in some cases some critics because this has been you know this uh, conflict in Sri Lanka between these uh, rival groups it has become uh, this, uh, the subject of study in many uh, you know uh, for uh, scholars and critics alike and they have come up with an, at another level they find that this conflict is actually not about ethnicity or about any ethnic group that it is actually about a class struggle uh, between the elites or you know the who uh, occupy the center the political elites and to the economically backward classes in fact uh, you note that all these uh, the organizations the movement as they call it of the tigers and others they uh, the march they actually uh, uh, introduce or they get people in their movements people who have been living in extreme poverty people who have been uh, you know marginalized for years and decades so it is the marginalized tamil youth actually uh, who's who lives in ghettos and who's fighting the upper echelons uh, of uh, colombo it is this particular youth that is that symbolizes the movement and it then they become representative in fact of the entire class of the deprived sections of society who are up in arms against uh, the you know those with political clout and power and money so you see that then it turns into it it can also be looked at a, as a kind of a class fight or a kind of a, um, a class conflict in fact so at and so these are the two levels in which one can look at the conflict the third level as i mentioned earlier as, as well was um, to do with the nationalist view uh, that uh, that uh, that this narrative has assumed you know it has it has also come to now because it is a kind of a threat to the unification of Sri Lanka it is a, becomes a kind of a threat to uh, the national uh, entity called Sri Lanka then the nationalist discourse actually uh, looks at it as a kind of uh, uh, a rebel from within uh, you know a kind of a rebelling youth that uh, that goes against the interest of the nation and hence they are seen as suspect in the eyes of authority authorities and uh, you know they, they, are, they need to be quashed because then they become na threats to national security as well and in that sense you know they, they could be also considered in that sense uh, anti-nationals because they have uh, worked against the interest of the nations so you see how this um, the fight this tussle uh, has uh, has gained these dimensions which are not uh, just uh, political but also uh, from that point of view economic as also uh, uh, pertaining to uh, the nation it must be very complex Mm -hmm. This kind of a thing, different, uh, you know, in interests working against one another, 
and uh, creating a problem for the state and, and for themselves. Right. Hmm. Also, you see this kind of conflict, uh, I mean, is, is not, it's in fact said that uh, this conflict was not uh, entirely against the Sinhalese, but against even the upper class Tamils hmm. who were working against the uh, or who were not supporting the interest of the poor. Hmm. So it may have triggered off as a kind of a language issue where because in the 19, because in 1956 uh, the Sinhala only act uh, pa, uh, you know, it made Sinhalese, uh, it made Sinhala the uh, the official language of Sri Lanka. That would have been the trigger. But I think um, that what what later on unfolded in the following decades was a kind of um, a frustration of a population uh, that was reeling under uh, uh, poverty and uh, you know this kind of a life, a uh, life of misery. But tell us about the languages, if, if that is relevant to your discussion. Uh, Sinhalese, for instance. Yes, there English. is Pali. There is. Tamil and there is Sinhala, so these three major languages are there and of course the English speaking population is also there, so which is why the uh, literature of Sri Lanka is also varied. You have Tamil literature written in there, you have Sinhala literature written there, you have English literature as well written there. In fact, um, uh, you know, uh, there are and, and uh, that has to do with the ethnic groups that are uh, available or that live there. Uh, so, uh, you know, there are, so the three writers that um, I've, uh, you know, I thought I could briefly talk about today. So one belongs to, uh, one has written in Sinhalese and writes in English, the other is a Dutch burger, belongs to a Dutch burger family and uh, you know she's she's of course writing in English again but then her ethnicity is different, she's from a different ethnic group. As I mentioned earlier, she's from that small group of the burgers and the Aborigines. Dutch who, the, uh, yeah, people who stayed on. Uh, when the British came to colonize, when the British occupied Sri Lanka, so those Dutch families that stayed on in Sri Lanka and did not leave. So, you know, tracing their lineage to again the 16th, 17th century and they've lived on. So, how, what kind of life they occupy and what are their concerns? Do they have a language of their own, these burgers? No, it's uh, so it, they they majorly write in English. Mm -hmm. So that's the uh, they they and they don't. Uh, so they're not the Sinhalese or the uh, the Pali's uh, or and the Tamils. The, and the traditional beliefs. That their myths, their folklore, yes. are, are they also English? Yes, so they, of course, because mm. the influence of Christianity is there mm. in them. So mm. uh, you know, they're 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 captured through their the, uh, their life of their museums and histories, mm. and in corners in old forts, Dutch forts, etc. So you know, their lives take from there. So there is a kind of an eerie quality about their work as well. And uh, in fact, uh, uh, you know, sometimes even death becomes a constant uh, preoccupation in their work as I might be able to talk about one of the writers here and the third writer of course is also is writing in English so you know uh, I've taken particularly these writers who uh, somehow tell us about uh, the different flavors a different kind of a um, uh, sensibility that uh, belongs to Sri Lanka it's really fascinating the, the, the way you are bringing in different uh, you know uh, groups and discourses and they interact and uh, they, they negate reject one another at the same time there is a kind of national unity also uh, right. at, at the cultural level. Yeah, so there is resilience as well, mm -hmm. you know, despite this discordance that it exists in their life, mm -hmm. there is resilience as well, that, that there is a sense of continuity uh, that one finds. And now, I think in these decades, there is also an eagerness to resolve the crisis and to get over this kind of a, uh, a blood-stained uh, past, so to speak. So it's this. So you, you know that this war actually has taken about thirty years, and so there is there's been this thirty years of war. Have they, it created a discord in the region, and the conflict um, then uh, uh, surfaced, as I said, uh, particularly in the post-independence period. Also, another important uh, time. So. Of course, uh, 1956 is the time when the Sinhala only act was passed, which proved to be the watershed year in the Sinhala uh, uh, language or it, uh, watershed year in the country because Sinhala became the official language, leaving Tamil to a kind of a secondary position. What is the role of a uh, uh, Sri Lankan writer uh, or, or Sri Lankan literature? Uh, do, do they play an active role in the complex situation in which they? For instance, their writing can be, you know, uh, uh, supporting one ethnic group against another. The writing could be Buddhist in nature. The writing could be ideologically Christian. Is that the case, or? Yes, it is. In fact, you know, you see, the writers are um, the writers generally see. It, it consider writers like uh, so the, the kind of writers that we have, like Michael Ondaatje. 
you know, he's Canadian, Sri Lankan. And, and yet when he returns, so his father was from Sri Lanka, and, but he, so when he returns to the island nation, uh, he, looks at, um, uh, he looks at the family from a very, uh, from a different, from an outsider's point of view and the family appears very queer to him. You know? And so it's that kind of life that he can't, he's trying to understand its, its dynamic. Uh, its dynamics and also he understands it to be a very um, uh, weird kind of a life that they lead there. He is unable to relate. A writer like say uh, Sham Silva Durai who talks about uh, the uh, you know the in the funny boy he talks about the identity of RG Arjun who's um, who's trying to understand his own sexual identity because you know that it brings in the element of uh, uh, homoeroticism or homosexuality and so the person is trying to understand uh, this uh, one's own identity vis-a-vis -vis the outside world but then one has to realize that all this happens in the backdrop of the social conflict of the civil war and also this war is um, uh, bringing harm to both sides of the community so that is also an important issue that how it is uh, uh, it, how it is going against the interest of both sides you know so that is something that comes out in these works and but in one of the stories that i will uh, talk about uh, today is um, uh, you know the story which says no heart is free now here it's about the revenge mechanism of how one community uh, loses one's parents, one's family and then tries to revenge on, that person tries to take revenge on the other community. But then it is an endless war and towards the end it's a kind of a tragic tale of this protagonist who dies at the end because he's unable to bear even murdering. Uh, you know, he had to take revenge but then murder is not the solution he realizes. So, and, and there is an idea that you know it's not a war because war is fought with other countries. What we are fighting is we are fighting one another and we are killing one another. So that is the idea that most uh, most uh, writers try to give. In fact, very they try to also bring out the strain such as uh, Nihal de Silva does in his novel called The Elephant Pass. Now, uh, the, sorry, The Road from Elephant Pass. Now, uh, you see there is, in, in this you have an army officer who has a very strong view about one's identity and there is on the other hand a girl, a woman on the Tamil side who too has a very strong identity but how uh, they are able to come together and negotiate that kind of a uh, relationship uh, that is otherwise uh, meant to be in a state of conflict, they are meant to be in a state of conflict but then uh, they seem to doubt and trust one another in turns. Uh, so you see he's in fact here you see how complex the relationship is mm -hmm. uh, so it is this so this is so writers are not in fact writers being sensitive individuals I guess they are not really taking a stark position against one group and over another they are only talking about the flaws of each mm -hmm. and uh, the biases that exist in both and how at the end it is the civilian population that gets affected in both cases. Are there then a binding kind of factor in the culture of uh, Sri Lanka that they, they uh, critique everything and uh, accept good things from everywhere and that they are I think the region as such, uh, you know the natural landscape of the region is something that they all belong to mm -hmm. and they are proud of mm -hmm. and they seem to uh, take, uh, you know they seem to relish that. So I think it is the the forest lands, the, the natural the beauty of, this, of the region that they belong to, it is that that creates a connection because it's a lived experience that both can share. I mean they can't share their culture but they can share the region and its beauty and its uh, natural scape in that I, I find it very profound in the sense you know that uh, when you talk, uh, look at nature, when, when, when you look at uh, you know, human beings as human beings, uh, when, when you talk about good things everywhere and bad things everywhere, then you are projecting a view which is totally at variance with uh, what is there in the complex reality. So writers are in fact uh, playing a very positive role here. Yes, I think they are trying to uh, understand the situation and also rationalize it. In some cases they become maybe too predictable in the saying that oh we should stop the bloodshed and all but it turns into a kind of it appears it may appear to be a cliche but that is the requirement of their time and I think that's where they see themselves see their country going finally. What about so, modern uh, modernist being uh, is the, uh, the issue you know that, that uh, people you know look at themselves critically then this is a kind of a national ethos, you know, that everybody is talking about, uh, you know, subjectivity, talking about the being. So it, it takes them perhaps towards modernism and uh, all writers, irrespective of which group they come from, finally would end up as uh, 
uh, uh, critics of uh, the, the present system from the point of view of modernity. Would you say that? Which is uh, true. You see, when you say modernism, I think of the emphasis on oneself as well. Mm -hmm. So, in some cases, in some of the works, you might see that, um, like, uh, it depends on uh, the kind of uh, writing that is done. But uh, I feel that there are there are both streams. So, while they talk about the political and the social, sometimes their narratives also go into the personal and the uh, the subjective and the issue of identity, also exploring love, middle class uh, life. So you see the ordinary life is also, it's not to say that this literature is purely political or economic in that sense. Uh, I think they have, uh, they have those, uh, they try to also talk about relationships as they exist in life and uh, purely from the point of view of human relationships and purely from the point of view of a middle class individual that may have nothing to do absolutely with what is happening outside and who's dying on the border etc. So the civil war may become, uh, is at the backdrop of uh, many it may uh, maybe at the backdrop of such writing, but they also explore um, the simple pleasures of life mm -hmm. in that sense, or the kind of uh, uh, you know the kind of rifts that exist in relationships. So you see, also those aspects I think are dealt with uh, at a purely uh, at, uh, from the angle of a uh, middle class writer who probably has uh, you know has uh, no interest in uh, the war at large and is also concerned about the family. Is there a wider readership in Sri Lanka that people yes, read the Yes, absolutely. In fact, um, I, amongst all the Southeast Asian countries, Sri Lanka has a 92% rate of literacy. Mm -hmm. It's uh, one of the most um, uh, highly educated uh, regions. The country has about 92 or 92 actually, I think not 94, 92% this, this literary, this literacy high. rate. Mm -hmm. So with a 92% literacy rate, you have uh, modern uh, education available to uh, a maximum of uh, uh, you know population and with that it, it they have they have many writers and thinkers in fact in and writing in the vernaculars as also uh, writing in English mm -hmm. so and you know so there is uh, there is that kind of a bent to read and write and and this tradition has I think has come also from the Jataka tales that have that that are an important part of Sri Lankan literature, particularly uh, coming from the ancient literature, the tales on uh, the lives of uh, 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 you know the the Gautama and also t uh, talking about Buddhism, also folk literature. So uh, you see, there is uh, there are these literatures which have which are a very important part of the folk narratives that exist in uh, Sri Lanka. And now in the 20th century, the short story form along with the novel form have become has become very important. The short story form has really been explored a lot in the 20th century in Sri Lanka and has become a major uh, genre uh, for writers to express their um, uh, you know. Uh, so, in one word, what would you say about the Sri Lankan literature? It's a scintillating, fascinating, throbbing, pulsating literature? No, I think it is both calm and captivating in that sense, as mm. much as is what you would say about Sri Lankan landscape as well. Mm. So, they take, I think the region also plays into uh, the kind of literature that is produced, that it is, it's, uh, you know, it, it is both calm in one sense and talks about the slow paced life and then the rush or, or the violence that actually gets juxtaposed with this uh, calm life and also the natural beauty which is very captivating and is, is strikes not just the reader but the uh, subject persona who is depicted in a novel who for whom it's actually homeland. So I think they have a very close link with nature in many ways. Well, uh, the details you have given Dr. Chabajaj are uh, uh, very interesting in the sense, you know, that there is a great deal of uh, diversity uh, mm -hmm. in Sri Lankan writing and uh, it, it's coming up fast, it is clashing with issues, it's clashing with the idea of being there and uh, it has a lot of power in it and that appeal because of the uh, literacy level that, that you have been brought in, uh, I think is further increased. So uh, viewers, uh, we come to the uh, end of the first part of the lecture where Dr. Chabajaj has given a um, very rich background of uh, our cultural life in uh, Sri Lanka and uh, this cultural life finally uh, could be seen as uh, the crystallization of uh, you know ideas and feelings in literature. So uh, we, we look forward to the second part and uh, till that we have to wait. Thank you.
Welcome back viewers to the second part of the lecture. Uh, in the first part, Dr. Richa Bajaj talked about the background of culture uh, and, and society in Sri Lanka against which you know the writing of Sri Lanka can be interpreted. In the second part, uh, we expect her to uh, talk about uh, the actual writing, the, the texts that are there and the concerns as they are actually reflected in the short stories, uh, in, in, in the poems, in the novels of Sri Lanka. So without uh, taking much time, uh, let me request Dr. Jabajas to give us some idea of the text that are being written in Sri Lanka. Yes. So uh, viewers, I will begin with uh, talking to you about uh, the novel The Road from Elephant Pass by Nehal de Silva. And uh, here, uh, you know, this came out um, in 2003. Uh, Nehal de Silva passed away in two, 2006. So, uh, it, and it was, it's a winner of uh, the Gratian Award as well. Uh, he was awarded, uh, and uh, you know, for this novel because it explores the life in the forest and also the co kind of complex life that, um, you know, uh, that, that, that characters uh, have and complex relationships that they build on the way. So it's interesting, it's at one level a kind of a thriller, uh, you know, with, with suspense element. A, at another level, it is a kind of a romantic story. There's a kind of romance that uh, uh, that uh, comes to the surface between two opposing uh, uh, people, you know, people with uh, very stark different ideologies. They actually have a sense of a kind of a romantic relationship. So there is romance, there is thrill and yet a kind of, a, uh, you know, a kind of a, it's a biography in many ways of uh, also the region and of the forest lands and the richness and the variety, the rich array of uh, uh, the, the, the natural landscape that you see and the images that are provided from this world, they, they actually take you in as if you were uh, going through the forest and meeting elephants on the way, all that. So, you know, he's going into the interiors of, uh, in fact, Jaffna and the surrounding forest area uh, that uh, you have of the text. In fact, um, uh, this is, uh, you know, the, it goes from Jaffna then to going into uh, the, the forest area around Vani and also then going, uh, talking about uh, the, the national park at uh, Vilpatu. So, you see, these are the regions which are there in the northern part, you know, the tip in fact, as they call it the elephant pass, you know, that particular, um, uh, the particular pass that is in fact the joining link between India and Sri Lanka, you know, the very tip and the water area that exists between it, it's called the elephant pass. So, uh, you see, so the road from Elephant Pass then is, it actually uh, charts the story of a uh, Sinhalese army officer who meets this Tamil woman, informant actually, who is ready to negotiate a deal with the army and but uh, and provide information about the movement of the rebel groups uh, that are uh, that are in the forest areas as i said here in the lagoon 
and uh, areas around the Vani forest. So at the opening of the novel, you actually have uh, Captain Basanta who meets Kamla uh, near Jaffna. And uh, this, um, uh, so Jaffna is the northernmost part of uh, Sri Lanka, the, where the majority population of Tamil people live, the Sri Lankan Tamils live, as I told you earlier. So uh, this this region then is occupied also by uh, the people of the the, uh, the, uh, the people who are rebelling against the uh, government. So uh, so uh, then he meets uh, Vasantha meets Kamla, who's who, who's a Tamil and he is a Sinhalese, and to get information from her and to take her finally in in her in custody. But um, uh, and the girl is ready to help. Uh, but the, when they are about when they are making way when they are leaving uh, for the uh, army camp uh, near Jaffa. Now, then they are taken in by an attack by the LTTE, which is the Tigers group, also called the Tigers, who uh, uh, you know they are called the Liberation Tigers of uh, Tamil Ilam. So this is the, so they are they are they are caught in their uh, kind of a uh, they are caught in this attack and finally they are uh, captured and they are fight they are running away they have been uh, found at many places so and there are a series of bomb blasts that take place. Uh, so you and how they escape these and how they're moving in the forest so it becomes like a jungle uh, kind of a journey where uh, you know they have to also they meet other groups other uh, uh, you know uh, other groups uh, which are also uh, 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 sort of rebel groups and also uh, you could call them you know some lumpen groups as well who are trying to take advantage of them on, and get the girl so you see both uh, all these different factors along with the natural hazards that they have to have no water at one point they have absolutely no water to drink at another there isn't there they're being followed by a, a wild elephant so you see it becomes a kind of a very thrilling tale and yet in this tale you know you see a cinema man and a Tamil woman who get caught up in explosions, arms and ammunitions and you see how they define this conflict on their own you know they also come in they also so uh, you know they have conflicting ideologies because they belong to warring groups and yet um, uh, you know yet there is this kind of um, a relationship of as I said earlier this kind of trust and this uh, you know they have they are left with no choice but to trust one another you know and even when they both know that they are adversaries actually and they'd rather kill one another so you see it's that kind of an interesting tale and um, if i could just uh, at this point uh, tell you uh, how the uh, novel opens and give some quotations from the text itself then <coughs> i quote for 17 years the liberation tigers of tamil Ilam, the ltt had been fighting the government to establish a separate state for the Tamil minority of the country. The peninsula of Jaffna is the stem end of a pear-shaped island. It has the home base of the Tamils but now was occupied by our forces. The rebels held the heavily forested region called the Vani. The landmass south of Jaffna extended up the centre of the island. The camp at Elephant Pass controlled the isthmus between the Vani and the Jaffna peninsula. So, uh, unquote. So, this is the kind of a detail that the novel actually gives you where, uh, you know, how, what is this landscape like, who occupies what region and so, in a way, this uh, novel which is in, in one sense fictionalized appears to be more like a document or a history as well because it talks about the actual people, it talks about actual regions and places and army camps etc. So, characters may be taken from life and yet this is a kind of a uh, you know, uh, a kind of a uh, work that is um, that is very um, uh, historical in many ways. You know, so it's it could be considered a kind of a historical work as well. And then you know, there is this kind of conflict. Uh, 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 you know, the kind of conflict that emerges in the text. You know, and at one place he says, "My contact tells me he can produce a senior woman activist who has turned against the movement." She claims to have vital information and wants to negotiate a deal with us. It might amount to nothing, but I think it's worth looking into." Unquote. So again, you know, uh, and, and then giving us the history of the people who are also involved. So Kamla, who's, who, has, who has approached the army, she actually lives near Palai. So she must be staying there at the moment, and she, there is a there is a meeting point where both of them were supposed to uh, meet and um, then uh, go forward. So you see, there is this uh, there is this kind of actual time 
uh, movement, actual uh, places, actual uh, barricade, uh, barricaded lands. So it appears not like, um, in fact, it, 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 it's more like journalistic reportage which is done here. And it is, in fact, if you see how it begins, it actually gives you when the uh, when the text begins, it actually stays, gives you the date, 26 March 2000. And you know that's the first chapter. That's how it begins. So suggesting that this is a kind of a diary entry or a journalistic piece, and w which becomes a kind of a historical document that weaves into uh, the narrative. And further, one more quote that I'd like to uh, take from here. And uh, he says here, uh, "They hated us." the Sinhala majority with a ferocity that I would not have comprehended had I not seen and experienced it in the battlefield and I hated them with equal intensity. But my loathing was for the tigers, not the ordinary Tamil villagers. Unquote. So the idea of hatred that it's very strong in them that you know we I hated them and they hated my community like I would not even believe they did and these are people who have been living for centuries together and they were there till uh, independence they were under one head and suddenly this kind of ferocity that has come into their lives because of this war situation. And you know some, uh, and and again, this kind of relationship between this army officer and this Tamil woman. He wants to exert his authority over her, and yet, uh, and he hates her, and she hates him, and yet, how that that relationship goes through a kind of a change and it changes as they start living days together in the forest and start finding way of coming back and how they it actually they, he softens towards her and you know th this kind of relationship undergoes a kind of a, uh, a change that that's also uh, uh, something also the intelligence of the woman is constantly brought out you know how she knows the area very well how she knows about the attacks in advance uh, you know like in one case she says the uh, and I quote from the text, she says, the entire region across the lagoon was in rebel hands. And she, you know, she goes on talk about talking about this. And she tells him that this whole stretch of land will be under attack tonight. We must turn off to Palai, to go towards the lagoon. So she's the one leading the way. She's aware where attacks are going to take place. Uh, and you know, where uh, they were going to launch attacks, uh, further attacks in the movement. So you see, that is something that, that you know, that's how it's, it's fast paced kind of a uh, novel where uh, you know constantly they are dealing with one or the other thing how they are attacked and how they say you know rescue so the thrill factor is um, equally uh, important in this particular Can case a comment here? yes uh, and that comment is in the form of uh, uh, characterizing the fiction that, that, that you are presenting uh, the fiction seems to be playing a role of capturing the moment capturing the reality of society capturing the landscape capturing the people hmm. And uh, this is how fiction, you know, started in almost all languages of the world. Initially, they were talking about uh, the life that was lived actually, as if you know, you 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 held a camera in your hand, and and you were telling people this is what happens. Right. But that is old kind of writing. That's old kind of fiction. Hmm. In, in 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 the West, for instance, after the 19th century, people have stopped uh, using fiction uh, to capture reality. Uh, they start with you know capturing states of mind. From there, they go to ideas. Then they mix uh, ideas with the imagination, and uh, it, it sometimes you know becomes more uh, of a poetry, more of a dramatic piece than fiction. Hmm. So that stage is yet to come in, so far as uh, uh, Sri Lanka is concerned. I think uh, what you're talking is that the writer becomes also, you see, that is that may be there in to some extent in Sham Silvadurai, who becomes who makes the scenes d dramatic, mm -hmm. and who also uh, turns into a, a tale or the the tale inward. So here, I think the gaze of the writer is always outward towards the scene, mm -hmm. and he seldom goes into the interiority of the characters to an extent. He might project thoughts of the characters, like in this case, in one case uh, where the where Kamala says we know we cannot bear you in we cannot beat you in conventional battle but we can exhaust you you have to be alert all the time you have to defend every city every building and every economic target so the unquote so the mind of the right mind of characters is given to us but not the internal working of the character in that sense as you would find but then that also makes writing very self-conscious and very self-oriented in that sense so that uh, as in Shan Silvadurai I feel that you know he's able to talk about it in the backdrop but essentially it turns into the identity of the person who's uh, to be looked into so uh, that is one kind of writing yes but I think it's more to do with 
experience as uh, you know and and more to do with how things pan out in as ex life is lived out and less idea oriented in that sense so experience is an item experience is a slice of life and that item and that slice of life is to be projected through language this, this is what they do i think in the western writing what happens is and magical realism is one one example of of the south american thing there they play with the experience there they expand the scope of the experience here the person is presenting yes, something i agree i agree from that point of view that you know that the the ability to uh, work to be able to reshape the experience mm. and rearrange it and uh, uh, you know make it appear distant is something which is not there in uh, uh, nihal de silva which is some because he's able he's too close to the movement and it's it appears to be a kind of a adventure that is lived out as uh, time is passing and, and hence a thriller you know so it's meant to be a kind of a thriller of sorts uh, but with with a political social angle and you know and the idea came from your uh, use of the word you know reportage hmm. journalistic writing so hmm. this is the limitation of journalistic writing that is still there in some of the fiction that that is there yes it to some yes it is there in that sense it does not it's not in that sense so um, uh, you know uh, it doesn't work at as at a very intellectual sort of way if one can call that to be the case is that like, because of the pressures of the readers who 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 could understand this kind of writing than the other one which is elitist um could be but i mean i wouldn't um, be able to say much on that because you see when we are talking about writers that uh, what the readers want it's mm. not like uh, so it could be the best seller kind of a thriller that one is making mm. uh, th and that could be the approach of the writer but it's not to say that that caliber is missing in that sense that they can rearrange and talk about uh, it from in the point of view of perspective in fact uh, the, the, to 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 support your point of view one can say that uh, literature is able to uh, be in constant touch with the readers who mm -hmm. want something expect something and the writer is giving it which is not the case with the western literature there it has become an elitist venture so so i would in fact uh, suggest that this kind of a writing is uh, foregrounded uh yeah that is true so another writer that i wish to talk to talk about today uh, and she is actually an economist who has turned into a writer who's returned to writing creative pieces and is not ma known much uh, in that sense but uh, she, she's a shiani hulu girl and uh, she writes she used to she started writing in uh, sinhalese and uh, then moved to writing in english uh, as well she belongs to the uh, kurunegla uh, region and Uh, her poems are uh, you know have been collected in uh, this um, collection called uh, the cherry blossom uh, which came out recently in 2016 so uh, she writes she it's a, this collection carries both poems and uh, short stories and um, uh, so just to give you an idea of her uh, uh, poems and short stories uh, just to let you know what kind of stuff she's writing and how it gets connected with the larger political social uh, reality of the time and here in this uh, short story no heart is free uh, you know she talks about the character of raju who has lost his uh, parents uh, in an attack by the army on them and how then he becomes he joins the movement the rebel groups and starts working for them so he he occupies a house next to an uh, army officer and uh, you know uh, but he and next to an army officer to keep a track of his uh, the times that he leaves the house the exact note the timing etc and pass on that information now uh, it, he tries to make a connection with the girl the, the, the army officer's daughter and you know when he enters into a, a, a conversation with the, uh, you know one of the a uh, uniform sentry there then you know he says i am raju that friendly smile disappeared and raju saw a suspicious look you are a tamil raju nodded his head in affirmation so you see how um, there is suspicion instantly at the recognition of somebody be belonging to the tamil uh, section of society so hence leading to this kind of fear and apprehension also in the community that they are always looked at as suspects that looked at as uh, you know uh, not very um you know uh, uh, welcoming figures in the in the neighborhood so the moment the sentry gets here you're tamil he's quite shocked and he he would rather not have him and this this then the novel goes on and talks about uh, nisha who is uh, the army officer's uh, daughter and how 
you know Raju thinks of his own little uh, sister Gauri who uh, who he has left behind and he talks about uh, his father's movements as well let me quote uh, this to you and uh, he says and he's uh, you know he's reflecting and he's uh, he's reflecting on the past and uh, you know recounting the past for us in the short story here and he says that however his father argued that from independence his community did not get their rightful place his mother always teased her father that they were more dis there was more discrimination in jaffna and she pointed out all the time that the low caste people were not even allowed to set foot on the temple grounds she would push push, us, push aside her remarks uh, he would push aside her remarks as childish he had so many meetings with people who were members of the movement and then it goes on so he says that he got an emergency call that uh, next day he got an emergency call and was told his parents had been shot by the army on their way back they found his father carrying arms and ammunition and when he was arrested he had tried to escape with his mother and both had been shot gauri was sobbing while she related the incident he left with this bag and never returned to the campus ever again he had lost interest in his studies he wanted to take revenge from the murderers of his parents since then he thought of any of uh, anyone in the forces as murderers unquote so you see the idea that how uh, personal lives again get uh, entwined with you know political happenings outside how a family an ordinary family living out their lives where this bo boy raju is studying accountancy and uh, you know they have a normal life and suddenly the parents are shot and he's turned into a rebel and he joins the movement and becomes a part of them but he when he as soon as he joins the movement and starts working for them and he becomes involved in the lives of his neighbors especially he becomes attached to the daughter of the army officer and when he gives the information about the army officer then he realizes later on that what he has done uh, would cause harm even to the daughter and finally we hear news that the army officer is shot and along with him his daughter is also shot and it is at this moment that raju becomes breaks down and is in, is in a state of crisis because he realizes that he has actually in a way shot his own little sister gauri because he he treated nisha as a younger sister and and this is when he realizes that this killing has to stop you know and uh this uh, this idea that uh uh, you know the idea that uh, both on both sides people are losing their lives and it is and the, the fact that you know nobody is gaining from this kind of an endeavor and uh, uh, you know and, he, and then he obviously becomes very uh, emotional about uh, Nisha and then he says that Raju could see Nisha walking towards him with a smile then there was a peal of gunshots and he staggered forward he did not feel the pain but he felt a numbness creeping through his body and this goes on that the idea that he has been shot him that he went back to the uh, the army uh, to his movement people and uh, to the leaders of the movement and they shot him as well so it ends it ends on a very tragic note that the man who thought that he was trying to uh, avenge himself has uh, finally killed another innocent uh, life took another innocent life and this kind of uh, and the confession of it le cost him his own life as well so you see how uh, how how contorted how twisted the whole thing is and how one thing leads to another and at another place then shiani uh, huligol talks about uh, the in in this all this is also a collection of her uh, uh, poems so in one of the poems which is titled a request she says you do not speak my language i do not speak yours you took to guns and we took ours and now we speak with bullets palm beaches the golden sands of the paradise island are stained with the blood yours and mine you tell me the flowers bloom on your side of the country but how can i ever see them ever again if you always call for guns to divide our motherland yours and mine so this is the poem which is titled a request again suggesting that the writers uh, you know it's 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 a house within family it's like the you know your own blood relations you're fighting with and suggesting that this again the uh, you know commenting on the beauty of the flowers the blooms that exist on the other side of the country but which is inaccessible to uh, both because you know there you'd be shot the moment uh, a sinhalese go and uh, becomes a part of their life 
so you know shiani uh, hulugale is able to talk about these things as well apart from that her other concerns such as um, a uh, poem of hers titled ivory towers actually is a critique of the academia as well and about uh, uh, you know just um, uh, 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 high sounding words that intellectuals make and uh, also talking about how leaders thinkers writers they all just talk about the things that need to be done but never really speak of it and uh, in ivory tower uh, she says looking down from the ivory towers you do not set you do not see the pain nor the wishful look or the tears of the young and the old looking down from the ivory towers you do not feel the burning sun the pouring rain and the storming wind the burning anguish of the young trapped alone in the ivory towers you add up figures or multiply write ah, dreams yeah, 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 and dreams uh, on, po- uh, on poetry on poetry so uh, yes yes Uh, pl- please speak uh, uh, ask the question yeah i was saying that uh, with regard to uh, food culture in sri lanka mm-hmm. what's the literature there Wh- which situation food situation food culture food culture i didn't get the word can you repeat f w a p food culture f w a p food culture yeah yeah <laughs> food culture means uh, the way people uh, eat and the way they survive and live is that the question yeah 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 okay uh, i think there is a question uh, asked and this question is about the situation of uh, food availability there yeah, are there references to hunger and starvation there yes as i was just mentioning in fact i could not finish uh, about the poor and the poverty as it mentions in the ivory tower poem of uh, uh uh, uh shiani hulagale she says the trapped high in the ivory tower feasting in five star luxury worrying about child labor not caring enough to come down and she talks about uh, the pain of the, uh, the the those who are deprived in society so definitely there is child labor there actually the problems that they face are they are much similar in them very similar to what we face in india but industrialization of the level that has taken place in india has not taken place in sri lanka in that sense so people are still connected to the towns to their villages to the coastal areas and uh, they there the life uh, you know that they're majorly dependent on agriculture and the region so industry is now beginning to uh, enter sri lanka also precisely because of the 30 year war they couldn't have a stable government but now the direction that it has taken is also of uh, uh, you know it's also of industrialization but also on the capitalist mode it doesn't appear to be an inclusive social growth that we see over here so So agriculture is their mainstay, and co- coastal areas, uh, because they live on, there, there is a coast. It's a coastal area. It's an island, in fact. So they are majorly dependent on the fish life, the uh, the seafoods, etc. If you want to know about uh, the foods, uh, food culture, but a shortage of food is not there because they are connected with the land and with the natural uh, regions. But of course, it's uh, channelizing, it's processing, it's longevity, etc. They have to be done through proper mechanism, which i'm afraid has not happened uh, so far uh well uh, pawan the the question was uh, regarding availability or the food culture in general and uh, dr richa bajaj says you know that there are writers who concern themselves with this problem and uh, that they sometimes highlight it quite emphatically uh, but at the same time uh, literature does not uh, talk about economics directly does not talk about problems of division of uh, the, the, this kind uh, resources uh literature generally engages itself with the states of mind the the, the views the, the the feelings uh the, the the sense of rebellion the sense of peace and calm and through that if uh, some aspect of uh, food you know comes out then that that is that's a regular gain also uh, for the readers and viewers so i think uh, your question has been addressed uh, quite well dr jabajaj and please uh, now uh, because there is very little time so you could uh, uh, conclude in two or three sentences uh, sentences uh, so viewers i have not been able to t- talk about the third writer who is the dutch burger writer but uh, the two writers that i have been able to talk about shiani hulagle and uh, yes. nihal de silva uh, yes yes ha huh. please please wind it up 
Yes. So the two writers that I have been able to talk about today, they have dealt in their own ways through short. St I've talked about the short stories of Shiani Hulagale, and I've talked about uh, the novel uh, of uh, Nihal de Silva. And through these, you've been able to uh, see the predicament of the common people who are caught in the civil war and in the um, you know in 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 the hazards that are caused by uh, the natural life, but and also by uh, the social uh, system. Thank so. Uh, yes. Thank you, Dr. Zabajaj, for, for the lecture. And I think uh, uh, the main area of uh, interest in literature has been highlighted, and uh, it's, it has been that way a very successful lecture. You know, uh, Sri Lankan writing is, is, is you know, uh, uh, developing, uh, is, is growing up, is becoming more mature, and it's uh, becoming very humanistic in nature, integrating, you know, different aspects of life. So uh, that question has been already addressed very well by you, and uh, I think it's a very useful, gainful lecture. And thanks for this. And uh, viewers, uh, we, we, we request you to read now Sri Lankan literature from this perspective and see for yourself uh, where it takes us. Thank you.